Hey guys, it's Cal from The Lighting Doctor. I hope everybody had a great 2019. In this video, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about uplighting. It's the most common type of lighting out there, and I'm gonna share all kinds of our tips and secrets, a bunch of the accessories that we use for uh, some really good uplighting, and I'll show you guys a whole bunch of examples. So if you want more help with your guys' projects, please, as always, be sure to either leave me a comment below this video, go check out all our other videos on YouTube, or send me an email at cal at lightingdoctor.ca and I'm always happy to help. Enjoy this video. Okay, so I'm going to dive right into up lighting and when, whenever you hear up lighting, it's also referred to as accent lighting, spot lighting, uh, sometimes wash lighting, flood lighting, and I'll kind of explain the difference between some of those. I'll show you guys some examples uh, and I'll show you guys a bunch of different uh, tools, accessories, and tricks that you can use uh, just to make your landscape lighting stand out a little bit more using uh, the most popular kind of lighting, which is up lighting and also where I think you can save the most money because when people start looking at professional quality landscape lighting fixtures, uh, the bill can start running up pretty high if you're not using them properly. And up lighting is one of the most affordable ways to do it. Um, it's a great way to eliminate a lot of excess path lighting. And when you're doing it properly, you can usually get away with a lot fewer lights than you initially think. And I'm hoping that this video will help give you uh, an idea of that. So I'm gonna talk about uh, two kinds of lights to get started, uh, especially, particularly up lights, uh, which are kind of like your drop-in version. And then there's also an integrated version. So the drop-in version is, is basically, it's a good fixture like this one that you can go and actually drop um, LED bulbs into. Typically old halogen fixtures uh, where you can drop in halogen bulbs but now they've upgraded them so that you can go and retrofit a lot of those with LED lamps. And uh, to be honest, most uh, old halogen fixtures will be compatible uh, with the new LED drop-in bulbs, as long as it's not a piece of crap fixture. I mean, if it's an old junky fixture, there's nothing's gonna make it work again. Uh, but there's some reasons that I like doing this and I will explain that here in a bit. But the other type is an integrated fixture where basically you have like an LED board built into the light, which there's a lot of advantage of that. Um, you know, they tend to last a little bit longer if it's built properly um, because there's less, uh, there's less heat and things like that that you need to worry about. There's some other options that are good with them. Uh, the reason that I like using the drop-in bulbs for most, especially do-it-yourselfers or people who are getting started, is it gives you the option to be able to go and change the way that light looks without having to go replace the whole fixture. When you go with an integrated fixture like this. If you've been doing it a long time, it's no problem because typically you know you know how bright you need that light to be, um, beam angles, uh, all that kind of stuff. And yes, there's a bunch of different filters and stuff you can add to these, but I like the drop-in bulbs because it gives us a lot of different varieties of intensities, angles, all that kind of stuff uh, that you can achieve uh, with them. So that being said, I'll, I'll talk about that a little more and, and something else to be uh, to consider too is that especially if you're cheaping out on an integrated fixture and that fixture dies in two three years there's no replacing the bulb or the board you got to replace the whole fixture so yes you might have only spent 30 or 40 bucks on that fixture but if you got to replace it every two three years not only is it a pain in the butt and i'll talk about some wiring things that also make it a headache uh, that you want to avoid but now you're replacing that fixture you know three four times in the span of 10 years whereas a good uh, LED fixture, uh, an integrated one, should last you 15, 20 years or longer. And if it's a drop-in bulb and that bulb dies, you can just go swap it out. So another reason I like doing that, especially if you're a DIYer or just getting started out. But here's an example of what you can do is with those different bulbs, now you can go pick different intensities, which I'll talk about, and beam angles. And yes, on the integrated fixtures, sometimes you can add uh, different spread lenses and stuff. Um, but just to give you an example, this is a 20 degree beam spread. So typically the narrower the beam spread is, the further that light is going to shoot up. So I'll show you some examples later where that's important. Um, most fixtures that you're going to find are going to be some kind of form of standard, um, uh, standard 35 degree, 40 degree, 36 degree, somewhere in there is what they would consider a standard. And then you're going to hear about a flood or a wide angle lens, which on any of those up lights is like a 60 degree beam spread. And then after that, you get into wash lights where it's like 90 and 120 degrees. But basically you can see the difference here. Here we have a 20 degree 
you have a 35 degree and you have a 60 degree. So you can just see that the tighter that angle is, uh, the further that light is going to carry up. So that's important, especially when you're trying to light really tall structures, flagpoles, palm trees and that. And sometimes you need to push the light a little bit higher. Typically, you got to use a higher intensity light as well as narrowing that beam angle helps spread that light a little bit further. So just something to keep in mind. Um, so this is an example of just the different intensities of light. So when they talk about one LED, three LED, six LED, and nine LED, that's just, uh, that's really the amount of LED chips that's an integrated fixture, but how that relates to a, um, a drop-in bulb is this would be the equivalent of about a three watt, um, a three watt lamp at about 170 lumens. This would be kind of your standard um, four to five watt lamp that puts out about 250 lumens. Then you got your six LED, uh, which would be the equivalent of about a five or six watt uh, LED that puts out or drop in um, that puts out about 350 lumens. And then here you're probably closer to five to 600 lumens, uh, which would be about a seven, call it a 70 watt LED lamp. But I always tell people don't get too hung up on how many watts because a lot of the cheaper fixtures that are out there will say um, three watts, but they might not put out as much as much light or they might put out or they might say they're seven watts, but they're still putting out less light. So really you want to look at the lumens. Um, the lumens is really the brightness of that lamp. So 170 lumens, 250 lumens, which is kind of your standard. 35 lumens, I would say, or 35 lumens, <laughs> um, 350 lumens, and I think I said 250 here, 350 here, this would be anything that's probably, you know, 20, 25 feet or higher, you're getting into something like that, and then when you get into the um, the 500 lumens, this would be something that, you know, those big massive trees that are, um, you know, 35, 40, 50 feet or higher, and if it's really high or it's a palm tree or something, that's where you might have to intensify or tighten that beam angle to push that light a little bit further. In other terms, a lot of times you'll hear lighting referred to as a halogen equivalent. So it's how it would compare to a halogen bulb. Um, so again, this would be about a 20 watt halogen equivalent. This would be about a 10 watt halogen equivalent, about a 35 watt halogen equivalent. And this would be a um, approximately a 50 watt halogen equivalent. So that's how you can go compare. Uh, and it gives you an idea of really what I would say uh, when it comes to uplighting are your most standard lights. When you get into wash lights and some different lights like that, there's some other things to consider uh, like frosted filters, which tend to uh, make it less bright. Also, again, the wider that angle is, the less bright that light is going to appear. Um, color temperature. This is another question I get asked all the time when I say LED, people think, oh, is it that white LED light that you're used to uh, in like an office building and that kind of stuff? And no, it's not because most of the LED fixtures now either come standard uh, with a 2700 to 3000 Kelvin color temperature, which is that amber, that yellow light, that halogen or incandescent looking light color that we're, we're used to. Uh, most of them come standard like that, or they have a filter that makes them like that. If you like that white look, then <clears throat> you can still get those, and that would be something closer to a 4,000 Kelvin temperature. So that's something else when you're going and buying those landscape lights from uh, the big box stores and stuff. Check the color temperature because a lot of those LED lights are actually this white light, which is fine if that's what you're looking for, but that's not always what you're looking for. And then you can see... At 4,500, it kind of starts to become a little more green. And then at 5,200 is a little bit more blue. But um, this, isn't, uh, this isn't green and blue like Christmas and, um, and red like Christmas lighting. Those are actually uh, lower color temperatures. And it, it actually tends to bring the brightness down. So, you know, one thing we do a lot in the holiday season is we'll go put colored filters on top of our lenses for like red and green uh, so that people don't have to go and put a bunch of Christmas lights. The only thing you need to know is it's not this green. Um, this is a different green. This is not the Christmas color green. And when you put those red and green filters on, what it does is it makes the light less intense. So it's not as bright. So again, another reason why I like using these guys is because what we do a lot of times now, instead of going and buying this big expensive color changing system, say we have a, um, let's go to an intensity actually. 
So say we have this, we have a three watt LED uh, or a three LED, which would be about a five watt LED lamp. And we're going to go put a Christmas colored filter on it. Well, all of a sudden that light's not going to be very bright. So what we do is we actually switch out the lamp as well to a brighter lamp and we put that color filter. So we still get the same brightness intensity and we get that color. So hopefully that makes sense. If you're putting color filters, especially for the holidays or Halloween or whatever it might be, um, that's something you got to consider is it's not going to be as bright. So you might have to get a uh, brighter bulb. And that's, um, I know that's a big reason why uh, there still isn't a lot of color drop in LEDs that work really well yet is because they have to try and figure out that um, color versus intensity kind of ratio to get it to work. Uh, so here's another version of the integrated fixtures that you're going to see a lot. And that's why I like staying away from these. One, these are pieces of junk and you can find these all over Amazon. I mean, I don't think I really need to say much about it. But when this goes out, that's it. There's no replacing anything. This is garbage. So a lot of times people will say, oh, we shouldn't have lighting. You're using so much extra energy. It's bad for the environment, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Well, if you're buying a good quality fixture, it actually uses less. The better the quality fixture, the less power that it's wasting as opposed to these kinds of things. And the better quality fixture is going to last forever, whereas these just end up in a landfill anyway, and they use more power. Um, with any of the systems we install, they're low voltage, so you're going from using high uh, output 110 volt uh, lights on your garage and that kind of stuff to down to 12 volt lighting so it uses way less power so if you're still going to have landscape lighting and you're worried about the environmental impact well get a good quality fixture it's going to be more efficient i mean it's just it's common sense and it's going to last longer it's going to stay out of the landfills um, so if you still want landscape lighting and you want to just at least try and do your part that's a good way to do it um, the other thing too is a lot of those uh, cheap fixtures that you find on Amazon and in Home Depot and places like that is they usually come with connectors kind of like this and like this guy. Uh, and the problem with those is that if you look here, how you do this, two problems. One, you're just stripping the wire here or you're just separating the wire and then you're tapping right in. So I have this happen all the time. I get called out because one, they have these connections and it, and it stopped working because these are designed to pierce into the wire. So this is an insulated jacketed wire that goes underground, in the dirt, in the rain, in the cold. What do you think is gonna happen if you start piercing that with connections that are leaving them exposed? And even though they screw tight, there's still air and everything that gets in there. Eventually that connection becomes corroded and it doesn't work. And then the other problem is now when you have to go replace that, you got no room because uh, th there's no stretch here. You just basically tapped right into this wire. So there's, you can't take that uh, connection out because if you do, you have a hole in there, right? So now you got to make two extra connections because you got to add some extra wire to go put a proper connection in. So I, I hope that makes sense. But the basic point of it is any kind of connector, yes, they're way easier to put in, but they're easier for a reason. They're cheaper for a reason. Because I almost guarantee you because I get called all the time to go and replace these and then I got no room to work with so I got to put double the connectors in waterproof connectors the proper ones to make it work and I'll talk more about some of those connections in a little bit the gist is stay away from anything like this that pierces into the wire because I promise you it will be a nightmare some for somebody else if it's not you uh, if you're selling your house and you're moving and you don't care then you can use these, but, um, but don't call us. Uh, okay, so now I wanna just kinda get into a couple different examples of some uplighting and some things I really like here. Um, with a lot of the videos and stuff we do are always talking about lighting the house first as opposed to the landscape, because a lot of times, especially if you're spending a boatload of money on a house, you've spent a lot of money to add a lot of cool architectural features like these white pillars, the nice stonework, you got all kinds of peaks and stuff. And then when people think landscape lighting, they think, oh, I'm going to go light this tree. I'm going to light this tree. I'm going to light this tree. And then I'm going to put a bunch of path lights and that's it. And it's over and done with. And if you were to take a look at this picture, if that's all they would have done, um, they would have been missing the boat on a lot because I think they did a really, really good job here. Um, and I just want to kind of talk about some of the examples and things uh, that you can do. And I'll show you guys a bunch of different examples with uplighting. But you do see they have some path lighting in here, but I'm primarily talking about uplighting. So one of the things that I love that they did here is they um, 
is they use the lights to light some of the stonework that they have around these areas. Now, this is not always possible if you already have a concreted driveway and you haven't planned for that, but there is some things that you can do um, to, uh, uh, to still add some light there and I'll, I'll kind of explain some of those as well. Uh, so I like that they did light that. And typically what people do or what, um, how you go and do that is you don't place the light. And I find this a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll bring the light too far back and they try and shine it at a structure. And then you end up with this hot spot and you end up missing a lot of the structure. Whereas in a lot of cases, if you can actually move it closer to the structure and have it shining more upright, you're going to catch things like this, where you catch the trunk and you catch the foliage. In an area like this, you get it a little bit closer. And now you can see kind of the shadows and you can really see the texture of the stonework. That's done by moving that lighter closer and having it shine more straight up. Whereas if you were to bring it back and shine it directly at the house, it would really just light this up and you would just kind of have a hot spot. So uh, something to consider when you're placing your lights. Another thing to also consider, and I love houses that have a white trim and stuff like this, and this is a great example how the white reflects light better than dark colors. So light colors obviously reflect light more, so it makes them stand out more. So a lot of times we'll talk about lighting around windows and that kind of stuff, even when it's just like this and um, it's just siding around it because I want to catch as much of the white as possible and get that reflective light because then what it does, it looks like you already have soffit lighting built in and it creates a really cool effect and i know that so many people are are paying really good money i know especially where we are uh to get that those lights installed in the soffit that you can change colors and all this kind of stuff and and I, don't get me wrong i love them um, i think it's a really cool thing a really cool way to avoid christmas lights and stuff but it can be super super expensive whereas this is a perfect example where they put three lights down low way low um, probably about a 35 watt equivalent LED lamp with a slightly narrower beam angle. And now they've got like this whole top section glowing. And that's why um, I love taking advantage of that, especially in an area like this where most people would not think to put anything here because it's just siding and there's not really anything to show. Well, now you kind of create some cool effects here as well as you're lighting up this whole top area and making it glow. And if you want to take this a step further, and I talk about this in another video too, to kind of make that stand out a little bit more is you can do some shadowing by, um, I know something we've done in some projects is we've actually just planted some tall grasses kind of in front of the light and had the light over here. So it kind of shines through the grasses and then it creates this shadow pattern of the grasses on the house and it makes those grasses look you know, three, four times bigger than they actually are. So it's a cool way in kind of a boring area like this to add a little, um, I'll use pizzazz for uh, for another word. But anyway, there's a couple examples in there I wanted to show you guys. Um, I wanted to also show you uh, two really good examples here. I won't talk too much about the path lighting because this is an up lighting video, but on these larger, these giant oak trees, um, this is something where typically you're not going to get this with one light. So as you can see here, what they've done is they've actually used two lights on both sides and kind of have them shining up a little bit further to try and catch them as much of the branching structure as possible. And on these tall trees, this is where you're looking at at least a 35 watt equivalent or a 50 watt equivalent LED lamp. So, you know, a five, a six to seven to nine watt LED to really do a good job of lighting a tree like this. Um, another thing I like doing, and I'll show you some tree mounting options, um, but in a scenario like this too, you know, sometimes you might have the two lights here and then actually mounting a light in the crook of the tree that kind of shines up here because then you can really uh, get that light up into that canopy. You don't see that fixture. Um, it's pretty easy to fasten it to the tree. Um, but the gist of it is, is on a tree like this, and I find too many people try to light um, too, too big of structures with just one light when a lot of times, yes, it's a little bit more, but you're better off using two, three, sometimes four lights on a structure, especially if it's something you really want to stand out. I would rather see you have one amazing tree like this really stand out than trying to light every single bush on this property. So spend the money to really highlight this tree because this is something that, um, that looks really good. Another thing I wanted to show you from this example that I really like is how they've kind of done the stone pillars and the, um, uh, and the white pillars here. Now you don't really see the light here. And I think one thing you could do is this is where using maybe a little bit higher intensity and a narrower beam might push that light up a little bit further 
to the posts and to the top of the soffits here but i like the way they've put it behind these plants they've lit up these pillars so you see the texturing of the stone but then you still have the silhouette of the plants that are in front of it uh, which silhouetting is a really cool thing too you don't always have to light the structure sometimes you can backlight things um, to get that silhouette effect and then you still have the structure lit up so those were two things i really really liked on this project um th this one just real quickly i wanted to uh i really wanted to just show this area now there's some cool things they've done with some downlighting here to light these pillars from up above uh which i like um that's more of a downlighting video which i'll i'll make one of those um but it's it wasn't going to be doable to put lights down here not that they couldn't do it but it would be very expensive and time consuming to put lights down here and have them shine up oh uh, <coughs> so what they chose to do is actually uh, put their lights up top and shine down which I love because I mean obviously you can see that's a really cool effect but what I wanted to show you is is this area here and I like doing this because what most people would do is they would just throw a bunch of path lights in here and I don't think you necessarily need to light up this pathway area because you've got some good light here and really what you want to do is and I think this is off to their dock area is you want to make this area inviting and the entrance inviting so how they've done that is they've uplit the two trees to the entry where where they want people to go where they want people to look and that's a key um you know that's why we always say you know if it's entryways of the home if it's entryways to your driveway or anything like that wherever you want people to go and particularly where you want their eyes to go those are the things you want to highlight where if you put a bunch of path lights or two path lights in here on both sides then it just becomes overkill and that's not always what you want to do um i always have the theory that less is typically more so fewer lights to get a better effect and not only that it's also a lot better on your pocketbook um, another great example of how they've taken advantage of these pillars um, nice white house and you can see how it really really shows them off here and they've done a really good job and it looks like this whole area has lights in reality there's nothing up here it's just coming from below but because they have that um uh, that nice white trim and they've taken advantage of that it really shows it off and then I like what they've done here by also uh, placing a light up top and catching that second story peak and this is most likely a wash light as you can see it's a lot uh, wider angle beam you don't need the light here to be as intense you just want to cover a larger area so that's where a wash light comes in really good and I'll talk more about those in a sec um, and how they did that is with gutter mounts um, it's a really easy way to do it I'll, I'll um, I think I got pictures of a couple different mounts but uh, gutter mounts is a really easy way to mount a light in a gutter uh, and have it shining up and the way you do that is basically a gutter mount looks like this it fits in the gutter just like so and then you screw the fixture into the light and then you can angle it where it needs to go so here's what it looks like it's got a half inch thread as do most uh landscape lights are going to have a half inch thread unless it's again one of those piece of junk ones then who knows what it's got um but they typically have a half inch thread so really any mounting bracket bracket that has a half inch thread you can use a standard uh up light wash light and so on and that's kind of what it looks like and then you can still angle it to wherever you need to um, you can put all your connections and wire and everything right in these trucks because like I talked about earlier it's all going to be waterproof wire connections so typically what we'll do in a case like this is say we wanted to get a light up here I would actually run that wire right up inside the east trough again our wire is insulated it's going to be fine we're going to use wireproof connectors and I'm going to run my wire and my connections right in there so they're totally hidden nobody would ever see it and then I mount that light on that second story and really I'm the only one that knows it's there and we can do that again because we're using these waterproof fixtures these are two of my favorites um, there's some other ones I'll, I'll briefly touch on but I like these because these are both gel filled um, this tube is gel filled and these guys are gel filled so that when you slide the wires in the ports um, and if you want more info on that just search uh, lighting doctor on YouTube um, wiring diagram and I got some really good examples uh, that shows you exactly how to go and do this um, but with any connector you use and there's other ones too that are very good but you want to make sure they have two main things they've got some kind of waterproofing uh, gel filled uh, whatever it be but something that's going to keep the water out whether it's uh, a bag that's full of gel there's many different versions and you want to have some kind of mechanical um, uh, connectivity and all that means is so that it keeps the wires from pulling apart so when the wires go in this one 
this part snaps closed and the wires are in there nice and secure. When you wire the, the wires into this nut and slide it in here and snap this closed, both of those are going to be very tough to get the wires out. Uh, another good measure, it's always a good idea to either zip tie the wires or put some extra tape just to make sure that they don't uh, pull out because the last thing you want to have to go do is digging up um, digging up wiring connections but uh, waterproofing and those mechanical connections are a must that's why those piercing ones I just don't like because you have no integrity whatsoever when it comes to waterproofing um, I wanted to show you this example now these are up lights but these are more in-ground lights that are in the concrete um, and I'll show you some examples of those but um, it's more that the reason I like this is they took advantage of the entryway right I just talked about where do you want the person's eyes to go so in this case they again they didn't use a lot of path lights they used just enough uh, to give a little bit of light on the walkway but they really want to just take the visitors or your uh, attention to the areas you want so they have this island area here where they lit up this tree and some path lights here so they've got this as a viewing area and then they went and they made the entryway very inviting by lighting up these two large pillars and then as well with this tree over here so that as you're walking in um, you know it's a very balanced light and it's not overkill with a bunch of extra high maintenance lights that you're going to have around this walkway and the other reason I wanted to talk about this is that anytime you are doing this um, throwing some lights in an area that maybe by an entryway or a high walking area or traffic in a lot of cases you might want to add something called a hex baffle um, hex baffles is this honeycomb filter it fits over the bulb <coughs> or the lens and all it does is it helps keep some of the side uh, deflection of that light from going in your eyes as you're walking up and down it's a very cheap add-on uh, but anytime you have an up light that's in kind of a high traffic area it is something you definitely want to consider and basically just slips under the glass over the lens um, and that's it so the, here's a here's a light i wanted to talk about this is a newer one i've done some videos on this um, but a lot of times when you have those garage areas like i showed in an earlier picture and i'll go back to that i like this as an option because what you can do is you can actually go replace some of the outdoor fixtures that you have already with this light and light down below and light up above and what's cool is even if you have line voltage fixtures which is 120 volt fixtures you can go and use this light and i'll show you how even though this is a low voltage light because if you wire that 110 volt into this you're going to blow that light so you don't want to do that so what you do instead is we go put a separate piece in here that helps that and um and i don't think i i put it in here but basically it's a um, it's a step down transformer so i'll show you so here's an example of where i might use something like that where we have concrete down below in a perfect world or pavement down below in a perfect world i'd love to have like a in-ground accent light here that shines up <clears throat> on this tree and up on here uh, and then maybe even gets to the tops but i don't want to have to go digging into asphalt and and all that comes with that so what i could do because in a lot of cases you know i find that a lot of houses we do people either don't leave these on or they're so bright that they just overwhelm the, the whole area whereas now you can use that light that i just showed uh, go and replace it here and have the light going up and down so it highlights this section it highlights this plant below and it highlights up above and because it's angled you're going to catch some of those peaks and the way you go and do that is that something called a step down transformer it's like a $17 little part that basically you go and take your 110 volt wires that are coming from the house you wire them into it and then you wire your low voltage fixture <clears throat> into uh, that step down transformer and you can easily go convert these lights so uh, it's something i like doing um, it is another option there's other things you can do um, another thing i like to do in a picture like that is is lights in pots now this is a picture of a path light but in essence you could do the same thing with an up light and we've done this before whereas typically these pots <coughs> uh, especially any of these bigger pots you have a drainage hole in the bottom that you can run wire through and then you can just hide it in the ground over here but so in a case like this what i might do is i might actually <clears throat> and again it might be a little tough here because there's pavement but say it was just on the corners or i just had them on the corners well i could go and put an up light in here behind here 
and have it shining up on on this section and then like that earlier picture you would have the silhouette of the smaller um, shrub or planting and then you would have this whole back area lit up so something i like doing i like doing it with path lights around pools and stuff like this anywhere where there's a lot of concrete you don't want to have to mess with having to throw um, doing a bunch of drilling into concrete and all that kind of stuff it's kind of a cool way to go and um, uh, and add some lights so I, I like that idea again this is um, this is an area where you could do that right here so instead of if you couldn't put these lights down below you could have a light like that up here and it would shine down below and it would hit the top of the soffit which would give you the same reflective light look that you have here but you wouldn't see this glaring uh, light source which in this case they did a good job of softening that light and that's something else I'll recommend is anytime you have these lights and you want them to fit into your landscape, you probably want to use a lot uh, less intense light in there than you typically would. You don't want to use, um, you know, a big 100 watt halogen fix or bulb that's just going to be, you know, when you look at it, and that's all you see. You want something a lot softer, like a lot subtler. A lot of times what people will do is um, those kind of fake flame burning uh, light bulbs they'll put those in and that can be a cool fixture or feature too if you don't want to get rid of those altogether and you're still able to maybe do some of this but you don't want this to take over the scene um, you can go do some things like that another example of why i love lighting the house um, and again a lot of people just think light the landscape and don't light the house but i think in a case like this if you were to do that i know what would happen they would have these two trees lit up and then they would have a bunch of path lights here, a bunch of path lights here, and a bunch of path lights here. And that's it. And then this whole house area would be missed. And although they don't have rock work or texturing uh, or anything like that here, you can see how even if it's just siding, how just placing the lights properly in the right positions, um, nice and balanced. Uh, that's the other thing you always want to consider when you're putting lights. It's not so much that you're lighting every structure or everything is that you just have a nice balance of light with even consistent spacing throughout the whole project so on this whole house they've used one two three four five six seven eight and then two lights back here so 10 up lights on this whole area whereas i guarantee you if they were done the landscape you'd have two up lights and you would have probably four or five path lights four or five path lights and then a bunch more it would be a lot more expensive than if you were to just do what they did um, and I'll just show you this as an example too but this is another area where there is flower pots and what's sometimes cool is if say you did want to light this front step a little bit more is putting those path lights in the flower pots because the other thing that does is if you get them a little higher up it's going to highlight the flower pot as well as it's going to cast that light a little bit further on this area here because that lights a little bit higher up um, and that's a path lighting is another video but I'll give you that um, uh, just to consider again some more examples where they've just taken advantage of <clears throat> the house here they haven't gone uh, overboard with path lights they have actually just two in the very front here that kind of highlight the stepway and then they've just lit up the back here uh, with some different um, up lights and then again you can see on these larger trees they've used more than one up light a higher intensity one because they want to catch more um, of that tree and they really want those to stand out and then something that's kind of subtle here which I like doing too um, and a lot of times if you can and you have a tree like this maybe it's close to the house it is kind of cool to be able to in some cases get that light a little bit further back and have it shining through some of the branches so that you get some of the cool shadowing um, in the background too which is just another neat feature to add on again another example it's just siding um, so most people would think, well, why would I light my house? Well, here's a perfect example of what three up lights on this side. And then there's, you know, a couple more over here and one in here. But again, like maybe six up lights and a couple they put on this tree. So call it eight up lights. Um, and I would say this is a pretty nice looking design. And again, this is an area where you can see how this is a garage light. And obviously this is for security, but how bright that is and how bright this is compared to um what you get on the rest of the house and that's why uh a lot of times we'll try and go replace those with something that's um maybe not as intense i think it would look really cool if this was like a one of those flame burning burning lights um and it looked like a gas lamp almost and then you really had the the nice features of the house but look how high 
up that light gets and reflects off that trim and how much extra light they get even down in the garden because of that white. Again, that's another thing that why you don't need to use a lot of path lights. If you're using reflective light, in a lot of cases, you can light up those areas very subtly without having to throw a bunch of extra path lights. Um, perimeter lighting is another thing that I want to talk about in a lot of areas um, in a yard that's uh, very enclosed and you're looking out, and I find this a lot when around pools and stuff, they'll have uh, stuff like this behind. <clears throat> And it's tough to put light around the pool because there's a lot of concrete. So you can use that flower pot idea that I talked about. But sometimes if you put a path light down by a pool and you're swimming, you're looking right up into that path light. Whereas this is an example where they just lit the perimeter. So, I mean, this is a cool idea. You're not always going to be able to do that. But even if all you did was a couple wash lights in an area like this, um, you know, an area like this, they use the in-ground lights here, but all they're doing is just having some consistent, like there's two lights in here, that's it, with some consistent spacing and probably another one or two in here. They just consistently backlit things so that as you're looking out, now what would have otherwise been just a big dark nothingness to look at, they have lit. And what's cool is that, you know, this is what I talk about. If you have some, even just some small plantings you can get in front of those lights, you kind of create the cool shadowing as well. And it makes everything look bigger. So that small little light all of a sudden puts out a big effect. Um, another idea, uh, another idea for perimeter lighting and that uh, that silhouetting, like I talked about, rather than because if you were going to go try and light up each one of these, you know, all of a sudden you get it, it's going to add up because you're going to have a lot of lights. Or how do you decide which ones to light and which ones not to if you're trying to cut back? So another way of going about it is actually just back. <clears throat> <laughs> excuse me is actually just backlighting the wall and getting the silhouette of it whereas now you got three lights uh, and you get the effect of everything that's planted in here and not just the front look of that tree where you probably wouldn't even see that you have this you know really cool brickwork here and then over here this is an example of what i was talking about if you can get that light a little bit behind kind of a different structure whether that be a grass or some kind of unique planting and you create that shadowing effect um, it just it makes that little light have a really big effect. So I just I love doing that. <clears throat> Again, just another idea of some wash lighting and just some perimeter lighting. Again, in an area like this, what most people would do is they would just throw a bunch of path lights in here. But really, all you're doing is lighting this this lower section. And this isn't the best picture, but it shows you how you can just go and light and <clears throat> show the texture of this wall. And it's not even that you have this many lights on it. It's more um, I want to show you this because it's really it's about consistency of spacing. So you could probably use half as many lights because you don't need it lit from section to section as long as they're evenly spaced so it doesn't look unnatural. Um, that's the best way to go about doing something like that. But again, it saves you having to have a bunch of path lights that really are only going to light a certain portion of that wall. Now these are the in-ground lights that I talked about. I mean, some cases... Um, you are going to want to use some in-ground lights as opposed to a light that's sticking out of the ground. Uh, the reason I like these is anytime you have to place it in a grass area that you don't want to have to trim around a light, um, having an in-ground light like this is a, is a great way of doing it because it sits flush and you can just mow right over it. You have the same intensity and bulb options that you did with the standard accent light. These ones tend to cost a little bit more because they have to be uh, completely <clears throat> waterproofed and concealed in the ground. So that is something that to consider so if it's budget that you're looking at um, any place you can use an accent light or, or a standard up light you're going to save some money um, but this is a good option or anywhere that you want to hide the light source so if you're trying to light an area that's a high traffic area and you don't want people to see the actual lighting fixture um, you can always use one of these too but in a lot of cases when we're putting those up lights in anyway we're trying to get them behind like a um, a plant or something anyway so you're not going to see the fixture a whole ton so I don't think it's as necessary to worry about it we use these more when it becomes a maintenance headache because you don't want to trim around it this is just another example of one you know a smaller one that a lot of times they'll use something like this in a driveway but without like the um, the half cowl here um, and it just slides in there's usually a, um, a sleeve that <clears throat> you can basically just concrete around and then this just slides into the sleeve so uh, just some different Uplighting lights um, that you can use. A wash light. Uh, this is just an example. It's uh, if you notice here, it is a wider uh, a wider lens. It has a wider angle on it. This one's about a ninety degree. You'll usually see ninety to one hundred and twenty degrees. So keep in mind when you're doing that, 
it's not going to be as bright. So if you have a, <clears throat> say you have a five watt um, wash light, it's not going to be as bright and intense as a five watt accent light because it's a lot wider angle lens. And with most wash lights, what you're going to find too is that it has a frosted filter on it. And the frosted filter, what that does is again, it makes that light less intense. So it's a great light for uh, smaller low line plants. Um, sculptures like this, I mean, here's an example. You don't need to overwhelm it, but you just want to have that one little structure lit up. Anytime you have like low line flowers or plants or pots um, and that kind of stuff, it's another good light to use there. Um, you know, different pots and structures and fountains is another area where I like using uh, wash lights, and there's many different varieties of them. But if you're going about your project, and you don't know because you've never put in lights before and you don't know where to go and put a light and where it's going to look best. That's, uh, that's what I love about this is one of the best things, um, <clears throat> that we ever came up with. Uh, and we, sorry, we didn't invent it, um, from King Innovation. It's called an Instalite. And basically what it is, it's just this battery pack. And I think I've got a, another picture of it somewhere. Um, but it's got this battery pack that you can actually go and plug these, uh, lights into and usually what i tell people is use a standard up light i just talked to you about in ground lights and wash lights your standard up light i think you're going to find is going to work in 70 to 80 to 90 percent of your applications but if you're not sure you can go and test it out with one of these uh and i'll i'll show you a little bit closer up on that but then you can go and you can test things out like this and see if the bulb that you have is going to be intense enough to maybe get up some pillars like this. So you can actually go place that light at the base of these pillars and see if you're going to get the effect that you're looking for. But this is also a great example of where they've used um, just some standard accent lights to go and really make these pillars stand out and really take advantage of the texturing uh, that comes with all that expensive stonework they put in. Well, I kind of want to show it off. I don't want it to just go, you know, go by at nighttime. So uh, that's, that's why I like this example and that installates a great way to go test that out. If you're just not sure if a five watt, a seven watt, um, a, you know, 10 degree, a 20 degree bulb is going to work. You can just go and buy a couple of each, uh, get one fixture, pop them in, test it out and get the desired look that you're looking for. And if you're a landscaper or a contractor and you're looking to get into lighting or you're not sure, the best thing you can do is go buy a half a dozen of those installites and a half a dozen what you'll use is demo lights so that now you go to this person's property and say hey i, I want to show you some ideas and you go put four of those lights here and light this up which is probably something they've never thought of because all they're thinking is i'm gonna you're gonna come you're gonna light some of these trees you know throw some path lights now instead of that you come with your four demo lights and the battery pack you put those four lights there you leave it overnight and they get to see it uh 90 of the time they're gonna say yeah that looks awesome and you and you put it in if they're not sure yet you go take that demo light away and they don't have that effect anymore and i almost guarantee you they're going to say well no we want that back so uh something yeah something to consider some more um areas where uh up lights will work again this is an in-ground light because as you can see these lights are in the grass so we don't want to have to trim around them so we've used in-ground lights and we've used like i said earlier um in palm trees sometimes you have to use a higher intensity light so uh, you know, that 350 to <clears throat> uh, plus lumens. And sometimes you have to make the light angle a little bit more intense or tighter to get that light to the top. And again, another area where they've used multiple up lights to catch the different structures. So they have one kind of closer here that's catching a lot of the trunk, but then they have a couple further back that are getting up into the canopy. So you can always do that too, is have one on the trunk and then try and get some extra light up into the canopy. And another area where you very well could have put a light up in the crook of this tree and had it shining into this area so that you're getting light all the way to the top of that structure now. Um, winter lighting. Uh, you know, a lot of people will avoid putting landscape lights in, especially where I live up in Canada, where um, it's supposed to be around 30, minus 30 degrees Celsius the next couple of days. And people say, well, I'm not going to put in lights because I'm not going to get to use them. Now, obviously there's no snow on the ground here, but there's also no leaves on the trees, which is what it looks like in the winter time. But if you place those lights properly and you're not just trying to light up, you know, one thing um, and you're taking that in consideration, 
you still get some really cool effects from the winter time. It's just a different look because now that light's getting way further than it did in the summer or the springtime because there's no foliage and you can get light up onto those top branches and those top peaks. And, you know, another question I get asked a lot is because they're LED, will they still uh, melt through the snow because it's not as warm as a halogen? And I'll, um, I'll do another video here showing you that yes, they will. It takes a little bit longer, but within um, a day or two, they typically will melt through unless you're just piling heaps and heaps of snow on it. Um, they'll typically melt through uh, your normal snowfalls. Uh, something else I'll talk about is risers. You know, in some cases you're doing a landscape uh, lighting project and you want to put that light close to the, uh, close to the pillars of the house like I talked about, but you can't because there's shrubs or there's something there. So maybe you need to get that light a little bit higher above those shrubs so that you can still highlight that structure. That's where a riser comes in. And basically a riser is, <clears throat> is all it's gonna do is it's gonna elevate that light so that now you can have it at the top of those shrubs so it still catches that fixture um, that you're looking for. And really all a riser is, is I mean, you can buy them, but you can also just go to Home Depot. And basically all it is is it's a <clears throat> metal pipe with half inch threads, nail th threads on both sides. So you can do that with a PVC pipe or whatever you want. And then it's got a female coupler that's got half inch threads on both sides. And then your fixture, it doesn't show it here, but has half inch nail threads. So the fixture goes into the coupler, the coupler goes onto the riser and the riser screws into your ground stake because it's all half inch threads. And now you can get that light up above any shrubs or, or anything that um, you need to get it a little bit higher uh, over. So risers are sometimes a really good feature to have. Um, tree mounts, I talked about sometimes being able to, um, I'm not going to talk about downlighting and moonlighting and some cool things you can do by mounting the lights up in trees and having them shine down and create that moonlighting. That'll be for a different video. But anytime you're trying to mount a light in a tree, and like I said, if you're trying to get it in that second crook to push it up a little bit further, um, I like using these, these tree mount stakes. Um, the reason I like them, they're super easy to, to install. You basically just kind of gently tap in uh, this end into the tree and then you put a screwdriver in this hole and you screw it tight. And then the fixture, again, half inch thread, your fixture just screws right into there. The reason I like these ones as opposed to some of the other ones is it's a lot less maintenance because over time, this tree is going to grow outwards, right? And if you don't have something like this, a lot of times what people do is they'll mount it right to the tree and then eventually that tree just grows right over that light. Whereas this one, one, you've got a lot of room, but then all you have to do is as that tree starts to grow out here is you just unscrew this and you just back it off and now you just add another 10 years before that light gets swallowed. Um, and sometimes when you do this, you may have to extend this wire, depending on the light you get, it might have a 10 or 20 foot lead wire coming off of it. And <clears throat> you can make a connection somewhere up in the tree with your waterproof connectors and put like a junction box or something. But if you want to hide the wire even a little bit better, um, these shrink wrap connectors are really good. Um, and again, go to, go to YouTube, search lighting doctor, um, tree tree lighting tree connectors and i show you some examples where you can do this but it's a really clean and simple way because it's black of um just extending that wire and you really don't notice it as much as a big bulky uh waterproof connector and these are all gel filled too so as you shrink these closed the gel kind of seeps in and seals everything off uh, and again these suckers once they're molded tight uh, after you've kind of warmed them up and melted them on they're uh, they're not coming apart so um I like those, but easy way to mount um, on a tree. And then the, the Insta light, the demo light that I talked about is basically this thing here. Uh, it comes with this battery pack. It takes eight AA batteries that go in here. And then you just screw this into your ground stake and you screw your fixture into here. And then you just take your fixture wires go into the two uh, ports here. And when you're ready to use that light, you just plug it in and you're good to go. And you can move that anywhere and you'll probably get... Uh, I mean, depends on the light, but usually you can get about eight hours of light out of that. So if you're leaving it with a customer, you'll probably only get it one night. So it's a good idea to go get some rechargeable batteries. Otherwise, um, you can be putting a lot of batteries in the, in the landfill and spending a lot of money. Um, but go get some rechargeable ones. Keep a half dozen of these on hand, half dozen demo lights, and um, you'll get a lot more projects done. And if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you're on the fence about what's going to look good, same thing, go buy you know, a couple of these and go test out some of the lights. Um.
Hey guys, as always, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. You got some really good tips for uplighting and how you can go and take your property to the next level. If you've got any more questions, as always, send me an email, cal at lightingdoctor.ca, or go check out all the videos from Lighting Doctor on YouTube and leave your comments and your questions below. And if you wanna take advantage of our free landscape lighting consultation where we can actually go and help you come up with a proper design for your property, just send a few pictures of your property cal at lightingdoctor.ca and also be sure to check out our try it before you buy it light where you get that king innovation insta light that i just talked about that you can go and plug some of those lights into test them out and find out what are going to be the best lights for your project so send me your emails cal at lightingdoctor.ca or go and visit us at lightingdoctor.ca or watch all our videos on youtube just search for lightingdoctor